Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you're watching PBS Books. Welcome. PBS Books in collaboration with Partners in Detroit, DPTV's One Detroit, and the Detroit Economic Club is pleased to present a Future of Work series. Today, we're featuring Johnny C. Taylor Jr., author of Reset, A Leader's Guide to Work in an Age of Upheaval. The United States is currently facing a contradictory situation between the number of job vacancies and the unemployment rate. There are too many job vacancies while the unemployment rate is believed to reach over 5% by 2023. The greatest challenge that business leaders face is access to quality human capital. Reset redefines and reinvents human capital. Johnny brings his optimism and personal experience to timely and timeless principles and tools. As a global leader of the future of employment, culture, and leadership, Johnny C. Taylor Jr. will discuss the complexities of the modern workplace, fluctuating unemployment, economic uncertainty, and a heightened urgency around inclusion and diversity. Well, that's why we thought this was so important to bring to all of you to see this important content. So enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Gregorian, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club. Welcome to today's exciting meeting. And I especially want to welcome our DEC members. If you're not a DEC member yet, please allow me 10 seconds to myth bust. There's no nomination or application requirement. There's no job level or salary requirement to become a member. We're simply looking for people that want to learn from thought leaders on our stage and those that would like to build their network. So you can sign up at econclub.org or have we got a deal for you? Because it's the holiday season, it's the season of giving, and I see Santa Claus in the audience. If you're not a member yet, and you want to sign up today, you can do so out at registration. We're going to give you one free event ticket to any event, January through June 2023. So see Megan at registration after the program. As we get started, kindly just silence your cell phone so we do not disturb the program. And if you've been with us before, you know we always get started with a pledge. So please stand and join me as we honor our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. The flag is to my right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, visible with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. A couple of thank yous. I want to shout out Detroit Public TV for our partnership on a series we introduced last month called The Future of Work. I don't have to tell you, today's workforce and workplace have undergone massive upheaval. And with this series, we're going to examine the multifaceted trends and issues that every company faces. And today's meeting is the second in that series. So thank you to Detroit Public Television and Lawrence Tech University, Dr. Soap, thank you for the live stream of today's meeting. I'd also like to say thank you to DEC member and good friend Joe O'Connor for his assistance with today's program. Thank you so much, Joe. And you all know, if you've been with us before, we love having high school and college students with us at each meeting. They're here courtesy of our generous corporate sponsors. Their morning already began with a private Q&A with our guest speaker, Mr. Taylor. So I want to tell you, take a moment and tell you who is in the room with us today. We've got students from Cody High School, thanks to our presiding officer, Kathy Weaver and Aon. We've got students from East Point High School, thanks to Kevin and Christine at KPMG. Schoolcraft College, thanks to Olabumi and Livia from the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. And of course, the best looking and brightest of all, the Manugian School students from Southfield brought to you by Tracy and Strategic Staffing Solutions. So how about a round of applause to welcome those students and thank those sponsors. A quick note on our season lineup. After today, we've got a couple of events I want you to know about. Next Monday, December 12th, we'll be at the Townsend of Birmingham. We're going to be hosting the CEO of 
Citizens Bank, Bruce Van Zahn. And to kick off our new year in January, it's our annual and always popular Michigan Economic Outlook meeting. And this year we'll be joined by MEDC CEO Quentin Messer, and he will be paired on stage with General Motors Chief Economist Elaine Buckberg. That's January 12th. Mark your calendars. Hope you can be with us. Also, I want to take a moment and recognize our terrific corporate sponsors and partners. We can never thank them enough. They're the reason we can bring you terrific program like the ones we have today. And of course, the DEC, I love talking about the incredible 88-year history um, and the history of speakers that tell the history of the United States. And Mr. Taylor, December 7th is a popular date on our 88-year history. Mr. Taylor joined a distinguished list of 10 other speakers who graced our stage on this day. And their topics were, let's say, fascinating and pretty unique to the Detroit Economic Club. Beginning way back in 1936, a gentleman named Ernest Anthony, I couldn't find anything more about him on Google, but he delivered a speech titled Problems of the Farmer, 1936. 1942, remember the year, a colonel in the Philippines Army addressed the DEC. His topic was the war in the Pacific, 1942. In 1959, U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Avril Harriman, and his speech was titled, Can We Have Peace with Russia? Well, 63 years later, apparently not. And in 1964, Robert Sarnoff, who was the chairman of NBC, and his speech was titled TV Journalism, The Shackled Giant. And boy, oh boy, I think that might be a different conversation uh, today. So and finally, and this was the biggest head scratcher of all, 1970, the director of the Helsinki Shipyard addressed the DEC on the topic of ice breaking and winter navigation in the Baltics. And wait for it, 250 people showed up to hear about that. So I know we won't be hearing about ice breaking and winter navigation today from Mr. Taylor, but we'd like to congratulate him as our 11th speaker on this day in Detroit Economic Club history. Congratulations and thank you. And finally, we want you to use your smartphones to engage in the program. You can take lots of pictures, share with your social media, and you can do that using hashtag EconClub. And you can submit a question for Mr. Taylor, and instructions are on your screen. And those questions will make their way to our presiding officer, who I'm about to put to work. Kathy Weaver is the managing director and Michigan market leader for Aon. She's a DEC board member, a great friend to the DEC and to me personally, and a solid, solid supporter of many things in our community. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kathy Weaver. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, DEC members and guests. It is my honor to introduce Johnny C. Taylor, President and CEO of SHRM, pronounced SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, based in Alexandria, Virginia. With over 300,000 members in 165 countries, SHRM is the largest HR trade organization in the world impacting the lives of 115 million workers. Johnny is a much sought after voice on all matters affecting the world of work. He's the author of the national bestseller, Reset, a leader's guide to the work in an age of upheaval. Informed by data-driven insights from SHRM, Reset provides leaders a candid and forward-thinking vision to imagine their company cultures in a time of global upheaval. Johnny was appointed chairman of the President's Advisory Board on Historically Black Colleges and Universities and served as a member of the White House American Workforce Policy Advisory Board during the Trump administration. He is the vice chair of the Board of Trustees of his alma mater, the University of Miami, governor of the American Red Cross, and member of the corporate board of Guild Education ICIMS and Expo Logistics. So please join me in a warm DEC welcome for the national best-selling author and SHRM president and CEO, Johnny C. Taylor Jr. Thank you.
Got to have Motown music in Detroit, right? <laughs> Welcome to Detroit. How about it? And you gave me decent weather. I mean, it was not snowing at least, right? When's the last time you were here in Detroit? So, believe it or not, it was about eight years ago, maybe. I was here with Jamie Dimon and Kevin Orr. Does that name oh, for yeah. the leaders here? Kevin and I, funny story, Kevin was the guy who sort of worked Detroit through your most troubling times as under the conservatorship or whatever it is. But his mother was my elementary school principal. And so small world, so he invited me to come up. They had a big convening when you all were coming out of the situation and I joined Jamie Dimon and Kevin. So that was probably eight years ago or so. We're, we're good people here and we keep it real. You ready to keep it real? How about it? That's all, the only reason I came. All right, good. We're going to uh, talk quite a bit about some of the fascinating stuff in your book, The Great Reset, A Leader's Guide to Work in an Age of Upheaval. Yes. There'll be a book sale and signing afterwards. I read it cover to cover. Fascinating. Just absolutely fascinating. So congratulations. And all proceeds go to the Sherm Foundation, not just the profits. Every dollar goes to provide scholarships to children in HR, those who are seeking and pursuing careers in human resources. So. Terrific. All right, we, we scratched the surface a few minutes ago in our VIP reception, but this is the most epic work change and maybe even change any of us have ever went, been through. And it's a paradigm shift for sure, and we don't like change as humans. God so knows. So give us your thoughts on where are we with this massive disruptive change, and more importantly, do we have the will to change. So uh, you, you mouthful. Uh, one, human beings absolutely despise change. And that's something all of our IO psychologists, we have a team of about 25 PhDs, IO psychologists, et cetera, back at Sherm headquarters. By the way, any Shermies in here? Come on, let's give it up. How about you got to bring your posse, right? But, <laughs> but um, so what we have come to really focus on is human beings' resistance to change, even when it is to their benefit. It's fascinating. And we didn't give that enough attention over time in human capital management and human resources is how, how very much human beings were resistant. And I'll give you an example. We're not very different than the human body. So think about this. If any of you have had to go through the very unfortunate experience of being a, a family member of, friend of, associate of someone who's going through and needs a tr an organ transplant. Think about this. You need that lung. You need that liver. They find you one that is perfectly matched for you. It's going to give you life. And how many times does that result in organ rejection? That's the concept. Human beings will resist anything different. And change, by definition, is different. And so what we've seen over the last three years in particular, and I remember the day, it goes down in infamy for me, Friday the 13th, Friday, March 13th, 2020. We all remember that day, right? You know 9-11, you know those days, but that Friday is when the entire globe essentially decided we're going to have to change the way we live, the way we work, our very being. And all of a sudden, people who had come to work in a 9 to 5, you know, Monday through Friday, work environment, now all of this goes home. And not all of it, to be fair, because clearly a majority of the U.S. workforce still didn't have the luxury of working remotely. We have to be careful by saying everyone worked remotely. But the reality is most of the people who had the ability to work remotely did for the first time at scale in our history. Well, that created all sorts of issues that human beings resisted. And we were trying to figure out things. I mean, it got really crazy, and we'll talk more about this. But the idea, you wanted to work from home. Oh, yeah, but now you need to pay for my electricity. What? And my Wi-Fi. Oh, and that free coffee you used to give me in the morning, you need to send me coffee. I mean, it just <laughs> kept going and going and going. But, and, and now we are, here we are three years later, there's been constant change. The one thing that's been constant has changed because this has been the great experiment, right? The big grand experiment about remote work, and we'll talk about that. And all of this change has been overwhelming to the human psyche. The workplace is rejecting the amount and the rapidity, how often uh, the change is coming, and we are, it's manifesting itself in an all-time high of people being unhappy. We're seeing you know, depression, we're seeing domestic violence, we're seeing suicide, the mental health crisis, which I hope we get to talk about, is significant and real. 
all of that is the response to human beings rejecting change, just as the body rejects organs. I want to set some context for some of the rest of our chat here. So up on the screen, I think, um, Amy and team, uh, we wanted to get 60 seconds on this slide here. Today's worker is. Wow, I'm going to be nice. No. Um, today's worker is smart. Let me tell you something. People have access to information that if you're a day over 40, we never had before. They know what they should be paid, by whom they should be paid, geographic region, hell, on the street that they live, how much their neighbors make. They are really smart. They have access, and they've also educated themselves about everything. It's amazing what information we have access to. So we have an incredibly smart worker. The flip side of it is it is absolutely the most entitled group. And I'm not just, this isn't just a, a beat up on millennials and Generation Z. Even people our age have become entitled in the workplace. And the workers are out of control. I was reading an article the other day after uh, Elon Musk took over Twitter. Actually, we were at the G20 and he gave this great speech in Bali about two or three weeks ago. But it was fascinating that he decided, we're losing money at Twitter, by the way, and have been doing it for a long time. And we spend $13 million a year on food, employee lunches. And so he said, we're going to stop doing that. And the employee said, he's laying off, this is a quote from the employee, and it was all over the media, he's laying off three, four, three quarters of the employees, and he's starving the rest of them. <laughs> Seriously. So I'm going to pay you $170,000 a year, and because I don't give you free lunch, you are starving us. This is how, this is the worker. They're incredibly smart, but my God, they are the most entitled work force that we've ever seen, and you all know it. All right, today's workplace is? <laughs> In total flux, <laughs> right? I, I often am asked as the CEO of Sherm, what is, where is this all going? And the bottom line is we don't know. And anyone who tells you remote work works, hybrid works, we've figured it out, is totally making it up. We don't know right now. And so the workplace is literally in the middle of a tsunami. And there are all sorts of dynamics, diversity, equity, inclusion. I mean, who would have thunk, and this is no way negative, but that we'd be talking about pronouns. Like, that everything is up for grabs. So the level of change and disruption and innovation as a result of much of that disruption is, is unprecedented. Last definition, today's work week is? <laughs> Non-existent. Thank you. Uh, and it really isn't, and I tell you why. You know, pre-pandemic in particular, we, Steve, talked about the 40-hour work week. You talk about the, the Fair Labor Standards Act. News alert, that was 1938. 85 years ago is when we decided the framework, the legislative framework of work. And I remember thinking back, we used to give people overtime. Remember beepers? Who's in the room? Remember you used to have your little pager, right? And if you got a call, you had to document that because that was overtime. Technically, it was outside of the work hours of the week. All of that's done now. So the work week as we know it, what happened in the pandemic is we brought work home. Remember, it used to be there's my work life and there's my other life, my personal life, and those two generally didn't meet. Well, now we've merged them all. We used to talk about work-life balance. There is no balance anymore. I hate that phrase, by the way. The kid's like, what happened? No, um, but there's work-life integration because it's all merged. On your little handy phone, your computer is with you 24-7. If your boss sends you a note on a Saturday morning, unless you figured out how to separate them when the email comes in from my 12-year-old daughter, so does it come in from one of my colleagues. So the work week as we know it does not exist anymore. And unfortunately, the legislative framework has not caught up because it's 85 years old. You spent a lot of time talking about culture, and you defined it as how a word that rhymes with spit gets done. <laughs> We're all adults. Um, so, <laughs> and you say culture changes are typically driven by a reset moment. Yes. How should we be thinking about culture change today? Especially for the business leaders in the room, and most of you except our young folks who are going to be future business leaders, uh, culture is something that in times past was a soft word. Right? If you were in HR and you talked about culture and you're sitting around the table with the CFO and the CMO and the general counsel and the CEO, people looked at you like, oh my God, here are the HR people, kumbaya, they're talking about culture again. 
And in times past, we thought it was about foosball machines and cotton candy and free lunch, and that was a great culture. Those were the signs of great culture. The fact of the matter now is culture is a lot more nuanced. Uh, increasingly, if you haven't had it, I'd be surprised, but employees are coming in asking you to articulate your culture during the interview. They want to know, what does it mean to work here? I'm going to leave my job and come spend a lot of time with you, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. What's that like? How do things really get done here? Like, I got the handbook, which in times past was an 80-page document intended to tell you everything about when you walk in the office, put your badge on this, do this, do this, and now, they just say, articulate your culture. And when you can't do it, you're gonna lose the war for talent. So what's the real takeaway? We all have to become very intentional about culture. It's no longer just a soft word, a feel good, nice to have thing. We've gotta be intentional as business leaders about describing, articulating what your culture is, and most importantly, Steve, describing the behaviors that actually need to play out. Those things that this culture will reward and those things that they won't, the proverbial kicking people off of the island, voting you off the island, that's what culture is about in the workplace. Now, I just gotta say this, unless you go into this, because he's like, I got more questions. But in times past, this has always rested on the heels of HR. HR was charged with it, and now what we know is that ev you're seeing it everywhere. CEOs, I just left a big conference with CEOs, and everyone wanted to talk about how do I create culture in my organization? Here's a headline. There is no such thing as a perfect culture. There's also no such, thing, no such thing as a good or bad culture, with the exception of illegal, immoral, unethical cultures. I got that, take that off the table. But everything else is yours. The key is to figure out and be able to articulate with certainty what your culture is, so that when you're recruiting someone, you don't trick them into coming into your shop. And that's been the mistake. We don't. With intentionality, we've recruited people in, we have an employer brand, it's wonderful work here, life is wonderful, and reality is, maybe not. You know, at Coinbase, you all know that company. Their CEO announced, and believe me, he came under huge hit, to, you know, when he said, listen, we're gonna be in an environment where you're not gonna talk about politics or social issues at work, period. No activism here, end of story. And if you don't like it, leave. And guess what, two thirds of his employees left. What we didn't hear though, was that within weeks, within weeks, he was flooded with applications and resumes from people who said, that's exactly the kind of culture I want to work in. I don't wanna come here and fight with my colleague over the midterms. I don't even wanna talk about that. I wanna do my work and I wanna go home. So that's his culture and very intentional, Un, you know, unembarrassing, un, unapologetically, he said, this is who it is. The more we do that, the better we're gonna be because you're gonna get employees who come here and wanna be here. That, by the way, is totally consistent with having diversity and inclusion in a workplace, but it is saying when it comes to culture, you gotta tell people how things get done around here. Culture, innovation, hybrid workforce. Yeah. It's a bit of a mess right now. <laughs> Understood. Sort that out for us. Wow, so I've talked about culture. Even the decision about whether or not you're going to be, which is the big debate now, I was asked, uh, will we be a fully remote environment? Will we be hybrid? What is hybrid? Is it four, one, four days in office, one day in office? Is it three, two? Is it pick the two days you want to come into the office or will we all come? All of these are the questions and these to me are very much part of culture. You're articulating why. See, we went in the early stages when Jack Dorsey, the then CEO of Twitter, announced you can work from anywhere you want. What I think he really underestimated, by the way, that was a knee-jerk reaction and it sounded interesting, except, I don't know if you've seen, there's companies out there who have recently found, ex, not Expedia, but what's the company, ex, uh, Equifax, learned that dozens of their employees had not just one job, two jobs, but had three jobs at once, three full-time jobs. You didn't realize that that very employee who was complaining about being exhausted at work and not having work-life balance, hell, they had three jobs. These are the things that were going. We didn't think about the implications, the cultural implications of these decisions. So here we are trying to figure out, does remote work work for some or for all? What are the cultural implications of having, and I talked about this in the VIP reception, so you get to hear it as well, is this notion, it's very clear that people who were with the organization, onboarded, orient orientated, et cetera, everything brought in before, they got to know the culture. What about the people who were hired 
during the pandemic. Many of them never got to know their employees, so it's hard for them to understand that culture. Well, now you have two different cultures, at least two different cultures, and the clashes have begun. And the I'm not being treated fairly, I'm not being given opportunities. There's an adage, uh, the, the old adage that goes out of sight, out of mind. What we know in all of our new data is that employees who work remotely are absolutely compromising their ability to be promoted because there's proximity bias. That's just human. You can say you like it or you don't, but the reality is it's human. So there are implications to all of this. They flow from culture, from decisions around how we work, when we work, with whom we work, and that's what has made this thing a mess. But to be optimistic, we're only three years into this actually less than three years. And that's why I call it a grand experiment. We will know the implications of working remotely. Last big point on that is we also know, and all of the data is absolutely crystal clear about this, it is harder to retain employees who are totally remote because it's a transaction. And think about it, you work for me and I pay you $10 an hour. I've never seen you. You don't have employees who keep you there. You don't have friends that work, you don't have any of that. And so the company across the street calls you and says, I'll pay you $12 an hour. It's just a paycheck to you. You're doing the same thing. So there are real implications for business leaders who say, oh, I'll let you work from anywhere. You're going to have a retention problem, and the data is really, really clear right now. Good segue, because you've got a chapter in here called Finding and Keeping Great Talent. Yes. And we definitely, we've got a numbers problem, right? Our yes. population is declining, declining. We've got the silver tsunami going on. The great resignation. We've got quiet quitting. Right. And all of this amongst, amongst, amidst a war for talent. Right. You think it's time for us to look at different talent pools? Without a question. So. And, and one second. Mm -hmm. You've got a saying. I want you to tie this in. Do good and do good. Right. Tie that together. So in times past, when we've talked, I use the term untapped pools in the book. And these are pools of talent, people we haven't thought about hiring in the past. In fact, we went out of our way not to hire them, to exclude people from the process. People who didn't have college degrees, or if they had college degrees, they didn't have them from the right schools. We now don't have the luxury of saying, you can't do this job because you don't have a college degree, especially when the job didn't require a college degree in the beginning. But it was lazy HR and lazy business to weed people out, and that's what we've done. Uh, the formerly incarcerated. The fact of the matter is we got seven, 800,000 people coming every year coming out of prisons. Guess what? If they don't have a way to earn a living, they're going back to prison. So you're going to pay for them anyway. And you may not only pay for them through taxes, but you may pay for them when they come and you become the victim of their crime. Because people need to survive. Older workers, here's a stat that I wish I could throw on the screen because it's fascinating, I just learned it. Bureau of Labor Statistics. People 55 and older for the next decade will take over more than half of the jobs in the workplace, 55 and older. So all of this preoccupation with the young kids, just to my high school and college students over here, the reality is 60% of the current US workforce is Generation X or older. Traditionalists, baby boomers, and Generation X. Millennials and Generation Z only make up 40% of even the current workforce. So if you're in the middle of a current war for talent and you are preoccupied culturally from a recruitment standpoint with hiring only what do the young people want, you need to know what a 27-year-old wants and you damn sure better know what a 57-year-old wants. You got to know both of them. And we have, <laughs> say, as you can. And the closer you get to 57, hell, the closer you get to 70, it looks young. But um, because the reality is we have a problem. There's an American birth rate problem. People don't realize this. Since the year 2000, the American birth rate has been on a decline. We had fewer and fewer children. The year of the pandemic, because no one wanted to get pregnant and have to go to a hospital or a doctor, the American birth rate dropped by an additional 4%. As a result, if all of you, and I jokingly say this got particularly frisky today and went home and procreated, um, you won't solve for our workforce problems for another two decades because that kid has to be born, educated, et cetera, trained, period. So it's an 18 to 20 year problem. This war for talent will be persistent. Now, we are seeing, seeing some relief right now because the economy is slowing down and we have indications of an economic slowdown. That being said, we still have 10 million open jobs and only 6 million people uh, filing for unemployment right now. 
And of that six million, there are a lot of them who really aren't looking. They say they're looking, but they're not looking. So you still have a talent shortage and we, do, we simply can't make this up fast enough. Therefore, these untapped pools of talent. Oh, here's another stat around older workers. Which segment of the US workforce is going to double by the year 2030? 75 years and older in the workforce. Fact, 75 year olds are coming into the workforce and we need them. This is no longer do good because it's the moral thing to do necessarily. We need the talent and we need them for more than just Walmart greeter jobs. Like we need them to actually be in the job, which is a whole conversation we'll have hopefully about reskilling and upskilling because the fact of the matter is my mom who is 70 plus years old is a nurse and she used to write all the notes down and take her records. I've got to teach her how to do medical records online. We still need nurses. We have a shortage of them and we can't produce enough of them. So increasingly employers are going to have to go to this untapped pool of talent. Yes, you're gonna read it, recruit at colleges, but maybe, just maybe, you're gonna start recruiting for 55 year olds and retraining them with modern day skills because we don't have the luxury to not tap into these formerly untapped pools of talent. I know this next topic's gonna to get you all fired up. So. <laughs> As if that one didn't, right. <laughs> So uh, DNI, we've got yes. a lot of companies that are doing good. We've got some companies that are trying to do good. We've got some companies kind of giving a lip service. But here's the question. Why isn't inclusion the standard instead of the exception? And I loved your line in the book, how do we reset an issue we've never really understood? Yeah, Go. and I know we have some diversity folks in here, so pull your toes back. Um, because I'm probably gonna say some things that don't make you very comfortable, but I've been at this work for a very long time and we have a lot of data, so this isn't John Taylor's opinion, it's fact. Number one, we focus. You use the term inclusion and, we, and, and when I started this work 30 years ago, it was all about diversity. Remember, diverse, the term inclusion is a fairly new addition. We used to say D, diversity, then it was D and I, and recently we've added E, and some people have added B for belonging, and A for access. Whatever you want to call it, there's been an evolution. Here's what we started 30 years ago believing, naively, by the way, especially for the young folks. We believed that if we had a diverse workforce, everything would be resolved, a more diverse workforce. Fast forward, America is as diverse as it's ever been, the American workforce, and at once as divided as it's ever been. So we achieved one thing, diversity, and then we created a whole nother set of issues, the management of diversity. It is very, very difficult to bring people together. I just told you in the beginning, human beings reject change. They especially reject change because of our very tribal nature of outsiders, no matter who it is. I, I shared with my colleagues once, I worked at Viacom years ago, I was the head of HR for Paramount Pictures' live entertainment division, and we bought BET. And so this is not, by the way, just a white male problem and resistance to it. We acquired BET, if you don't know it, Black Entertainment Television, and we went in and said, hmm, your sister companies are MTV, Showtime Networks, Nickelodeon, et cetera. You gotta consider their talent to work at BET. And they're like, oh, they're not black. We say, yeah, we got that point. <laughs> diversity works both ways. Diversity is diversity. And then we've got to figure out the holy grail of this is not diversity, it's inclusion. Bringing a whole bunch of people together who are different is not going to give you a happy workplace. In fact, it's going to create some other real tensions. And that's what we've done. We didn't understand it. And we, as a result, are living with the consequences. Think about the early languages of diversity training value our differences, tolerate each other. Who now wants to tolerate someone? Like, what's that about? A uh, heck, I should say. Um, but, um, and so we built all of this on and we just focused on our differences. But think about how human beings really interact. When I walk into a room and I meet someone I've never met at a reception, I start out with, where are you from? Where'd you go to school? What I'm trying to do is find out what we have in common, not focus on our differences, and we spent 30 years focusing people on their differences. And as a result, they're keenly aware of their differences. And we've not really focused on inclusion as a business principle. That is a culture, by the way. A cultural imperative is that we've got to figure out how to make people feel included. Last point on that one before I run, because I feel very, very passionate about this, is it's not just, and be clear, this is not just the civil rights categories of race, gender, age. 
It is more complicated and nuanced than that. Political opinion and a political affiliation, diversity. You know, it's something that's very frustrating when people can decide, I don't like you, won't work with you, will have nothing to do with you because we're of a different po uh, political party. That's right, or you voted for someone I didn't agree with. NBC or ABC News recently released a poll that said 50% of college, now we got some college students over here, college students said they would not take as a roommate someone who voted for someone they didn't vote for. So political diversity and you know, perspective is dividing us even with the younger generation. We like to think that diversity, equity, inclusion is an older person problem, but the young people are coming in with their own biases as well. So at the end of the day, businesses are going to have to accept that America has browned and grayed at once. And as such, diversity is now a business imperative. You're not doing it just because you think it's the right moral thing to do, which I think it is, but you're doing it because as you try to innovate, this big word on innovation, having different perspectives around the table and making sure that each of those different perspectives know that they are seen and heard will matter, period. All right, I've got uh, time for your thoughts on the future before we bring <laughs> Kathy up. And I know you got together the sharpest minds at SHRM. Did you include yourself in that? No, no. Okay. You always hire best, smarter, and better than you. <laughs> All right. You've put some thought into what's ahead for the future. And I think that's important because one of the things, the value proposition at the Detroit Economic Club is we learn from thought leaders yes. on our stage so we can think through the future of our businesses. So if we can pull up a slide, let's start with your thoughts and your team's thoughts on wearable tech will invade the workspace. No question, it's on its way. Uh, hands down, we're going to increase, and, and more than just wearable, we are now, there are organizations that put chips in people's arms to know when they access the workplace, when they're working, et cetera. During the work, uh, the remote work phenomena, uh, companies were actually, when I use the term surveilling their employees, if you're working, I wanna know, are you productive? because I don't want you to have three jobs on me or two jobs, I need you focused on me. So there's all sorts of crazy, and I call it crazy technology, that will determine how often your eyes blink to determine whether or not you're focused during a Zoom or meeting. So the wearables are coming, but they're not just from the company's desire to surveil on its employees. We also want to, and I love some of this new technology, I was out in Silicon Valley, these tools that will tell you when you're overstressed at work and therefore your blood pressure's rising and your glucose is going up and all of that. So it actually can benefit the employee and help us make better decisions. Mental health, a number one issue for us, we're able to measure different types of serotonin and all of these things. Are people getting enough sleep? We announced a deal uh, with Thrive Global, which is run by Ariana Huffington, to, because we know that America is sleep deprived. So these wearables are going to be a big part of it. Some of it, the downside of Big Brother, the upside is you're going to be better and more effective as an employee, which benefits and ultimately inures to the benefit of the employer. The spanification of America is real. Let me tell you, what's that about? America, the second now largest minority population in America is black people. It used to be black people, it's now Spanish people. The Spanish culture has become a very, very, very big part of America, and the implications of it are not going to be insignificant, my friends. We saw it on full display in Los Angeles just recently when you had damn near full city council of Hispanics have to step down because of negative comments made about African Americans in that market. So we are going to, where the battle used to be black and white, we're going to see some brown battles soon. And because everyone is now wants to be the favored group. And so we're seeing it in the workplace. Language and culture, making sure that notwithstanding the numbers of what they are, we've got to take a group that will likely grow to a significant uh, majority population in America. We've got to figure out how to make them feel included in the workplace and get the benefit of all of that diversity. And then finally, the concept of employee and employment will be redefined. redefined. It's already been redefined. Think about during the pandemic. It was so the first time in American history where people who had never been employed got unemployment benefits. Do you remember that? You know, for all those people who quit their jobs, I don't want a boss, I want to be my own boss. Well, when you were driving that Uber car and no one was driving, <laughs> you didn't have an income. So you turned to the federal government to pay you every month as if you, because you were unemployed, but you were never employed. 
So it's an interesting dynamic. So all of these 1938 concepts about work uh, are out the door. We don't know what an employee is. Microsoft, for example, has 300,000 employees in their combined workforce but only about 60% or so of them are the, actually their employees in the traditional sense. The rest of them are working in outside organizations and are considered part of their combined workforce. We are gonna redefine, and hopefully with some legislative movement, we're gonna redefine, perhaps even reset, the conversation around what is an employee, what is the workforce, what are benefits, how can we offer pensions again, by the way, how can we provide paid leave, uh, all of these sorts of things have to be redefined. We just got to figure out who's going to pay for it. Got a couple more. Next slide, please. Universal child care, big time. Uh, it's easy to say I don't have kids. It's not my problem. But I just told you in the beginning, we have a workforce problem. We need Americans to have children. We need them to have a lot of children. And we love these new folks, the generation millennials and generation Z, but you all have pets, you don't have children. <laughs> and so, and while we love our pets, we need children. And so as a result of that, it is the good for the good of the country that we give people, because if I decide not to have a kid because I'm worried about paying for health care, I mean childcare, then that's a problem and therefore people are not incented to have children so that we can replenish our supply. I fully believe that that will become an entitlement, or I hate the term entitlement, but a social program. And if the government doesn't do it, employers are going to do it, and we're already seeing it and saw it during the pandemic. Cities are gonna, that's it. We already saw it. Because of the pandemic, people didn't like the idea of living in dense populations. That's the way disease spreads. They realized that it was expensive. We're going into an economic slowdown. So people have now pushed themselves into it. I was talking to, I won't name the company, but they don't have a headquarters city. The guy said, we have hub quarters. So they have four or five hubs around the country, almost like an airline hub and spoke model, and there is no headquarters. We have hub quarters. And as a result of that, uh, we, we, we are seeing a different way to hire and recruit employees. Frankly, the democratization of the workforce now. You don't have to rush to a major city to have a job there. Final point here, which is really, really big. I'm on the, as, as, as was mentioned in the beginning, I'm on the board of an organization called Guild. Uh, we have a real skills shortage problem. Employers are saying, even if you grad increase graduation rates from high school and college, these kids don't have the skills that we need. And I know many of you feel that. They come to us with debt, and a lot of degree, and they're pissed. I did a piece of research now, the class of 2022. We said, what do you think your salary should be? What are your salary expectations coming out of school? $104,000 a year. 104,000. That's what the average graduate from the class, college graduate from 2022 expects. Now the number is actually 55,000. <laughs> so they're gonna be pissed the day they get there, right? <laughs> I thought I was, my expectation is 104, I'm gonna make 55, it's double. And so we got a lot of issues out of that. What, it, what we're hearing, and I wanna make this final point, in China, the education systems, and it's something we in America have gotten away from. You should go to school and be whatever you want to be. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to delay uh, gratification, going to high school, going to college, getting a degree, incurring student loan debt, et cetera, to come out, and no one will hire you. And we as employers are just as frustrated because we actually need you. We actually want you to come into the workforce. There's this disconnect. Increasingly, employers are saying, I will pay for your college degree if you'll take one of these five. Not anything you wanna do, but the one of these five, because we now as employers need the workforce, not just bodies with you know, pulses, but we need you with the skills. And so companies are pouring big dollars. I was with Jenny Rometty, the former CEO of IBM, and she told me they spend a half a billion dollars a year educating uh, college students so that when they come to them, they are taking the courses that will help them be successful immediately and productive and accretive to the organization upon being hired. So we, we I think, you know, people don't like to do anything Chinese or China, but the reality is the Chinese model, which is very much focused on making sure you are prepared to do something with that college degree or even that high school degree uh, is, is where we're headed. Thank you and your team for those thoughts. You ready for some audience questions? Yeah, yeah, let's go let's bring for Bring Kathy up while she's coming up. Let's thank Johnny for Thank you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Kathy. All right, thank you. Well, let me just start with saying, um, wow. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank Always you. the insightful. And tons of great questions from the audience. So we're gonna dive right in if let's it's okay in. with you. All right, so first question. 
We've had some big trends you've talked about, and what are you seeing that's shaping the talent landscape right now? Wage inflation. Number one, wage inflation. We're all talking about inflation. The issue right now, top of mind for every business leader in this room, is every one of your employees wants more. They want to be paid more. Uh, and frankly, interestingly, they want to work less. But anyway, um, but they want to make more. Here's the problem. We're going into this economic slowdown where your consumer doesn't want to pay anymore. And so having to educate the workforce to say, I'd love to double your salary, except people are buying fewer cups of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts and fewer cups at Starbucks, and they're rejecting this notion. So I have nowhere to pass these costs on to. And that is the issue. I, every CEO I, spoke, I speak with, it's either one, two, or three on their list, is wage inflation. We don't know how to get this under control. And I understand on the employee side, interest rates are going up. By the way, they think 7% is high. Those of us who've been around have seen much higher interest rates. But interest rates, student loan debt, the cost of fuel, I get it. But we also have to make money. Businesses don't exist if they don't make money. So there's this real conflict that is at play. And we're seeing it a lot with unions right now. And I've been through this story. I was a former, not union lawyer, I was a management lawyer in the labor and employment space. And at some point we say, you know what, we'll give you anything you want in this negotiation. We're gonna simply file for bankruptcy when it's over because if the math doesn't work, we can't make it work. That's the problem, wage inflation. All right, so if we turn from wage inflation to the uncertainty of the economy. Yeah right, which is completely affecting that. What do you think employees should expect? Yeah, it's gonna be a bumpy Q1 and Q2. You've already seen a bumpy, the beginnings of the bumpy of a Q, I mean, all of, and remember tech were always the companies that were sort of immune to all of this. Well, they've been the first layoffs, right? And they're doing it in significant numbers. It's gonna get uglier, partially because of the pandemic. We realized, see, I had to say this to an employee the other day, be careful what you pray for. Came to me and said, I can do a job I can do my job anywhere. I don't need to be in the office. I'm an individual contributor. I don't need to be part of your culture. I just need to do my work. I can do it from anywhere. I said, hmm, good point. That means I can hire from anywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer limited to the 50 mile radius of my office, which means I can hire from anywhere and likely cheaper than you. Report just came out. The American, uh, the US economy, in America, I should say, the US has the number one highest average pay salary in the world. So in the world, U.S. So that means, as a result, employers are now saying, yep, you're right, I can do this remotely. And those who are, and I can hire remotely, and they're also saying, and we can use technology. Ever been in a McDonald's lately? Hell, I went the other day, no one was in the front. You ordered your meal. No cash registers, no cashiers in the traditional sense. So we're finding ways to operate more economically. And employees, how can you do it? You've, especially to the young people in the room, you've got to figure out how to be valuable. It's not just you know, showing up to work. If you don't add value, you are likely not to have a long-term career. What's your McG McDonald's go-to? Number one, Big Mac meal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you talked about what is going on with the hybrid work environment. Yes. And I recognize this means it's a bit of a crystal ball for you, but do you think we're at the beginning, the middle, or the end? We're toward the end. We're beginning to figure it out. And if you haven't seen it, uh, the companies have decided fully remote is not, there are some exceptions, let me be clear, where fully remote does make sense, especially in some of the tech spaces. So I'm not an anti-remote person, but when it comes to culture, which is important, uh, we've decided that hybrid is probably the answer. And now we're honing in on somewhere between three and four days. Some are three, two environments, and some are four, one. I predict that the four ones will ultimately come back to three, two, but I think they're, in t and you all are following me when I say four, one. Four days in the office, one day remote. I just saw Snap just announced 4-1. Several companies are doing it. And I think it's the idea that we've got to get you back to work. And then we can loosen the reins a little bit to ensure that you can do it. I was with a company the other day that said their one day is going to be Wednesday. Um, fascinating. I will tell you there's some data that suggested, and we know this from Sherm firsthand, not only our research, but I did it in our workplace. Something happens when you give people Friday as their day off. They think it's their day off. And so Thursday becomes your Friday, and you see a precipitous drop in productivity. Half day Thursday is when it starts, and it gets pretty ugly on Friday. Uh, and so it's not, and so companies are really sensitive to that. 
If I can tell you anything, start with Mondays. <laughs> Fridays are not, you are really gonna be harmed by it. Your employees just naturally are going to decide, I can do things on Friday. People start to sputter off on Fridays anyway, but it gets really bad when you say that because it begins to affect Thursday. So where do I think we are? We're toward the end of it, and I think we settle in with hybrid, and I think the hybrid is 4-1 in many instances, 3-2 for the more liberal organizations. All right, so during the fireside chat section with Steve, you talked about technology and the effect yes. at work. You just yes. shared your visit to McDonald's where you mm -hmm. bought your Big Mac. That's right. Um, so if you're tethered to your smartphone all the time, like most of us are, do you really leave your job? And how do we try and guide our colleagues on how to balance? Yeah, that's a, that's a really big deal. And we have to be as intentional about that as I talked about other forms of culture. People cannot work 24-7. Someone told me you can't sprint a mile or a marathon. Maybe you can, I can't. But the idea is you can't expect people to work at all times. They will break. They just will. And so companies are having to be far more intentional about listening to their employees. One, looking for the signs. And the signs aren't always someone comes in and tells you they're tired, but your job is to be sensing constantly. And that's a big part of the HR work is not to, you know, we want people to work hard because work is, is hard and smart and good and all that good stuff. But we have to stop. This idea that people are working 70, 80 hours a week does not benefit you. There's a point at which you get diminishing returns and you definitely will experience turnover. So we're being very intentional about, I just rolled out a new EAP plan and let me just be a big advocate of this. Please go back and revisit your EAP plan. The current plans are shameful. If you, you know, if you have a health condition, we'll let you go to the doctor until you get well or not. But when you have a mental health crisis, what we say is you get three calls to our EAP, maybe five. And if you're not well, oh well. And we've got to be far more intentional about it. In this process, it's not just reacting to someone who's in crisis, but sleep, which Ariana Huffington talks a lot about, is incredibly important well-being all together, we as companies are going to have to put medical health and, and, and so physical health, I should say, and mental health on parity. And we've not done a good job of that. And we know that we have a crisis in this country. All right, so on that note, we're gonna switch to what we call the lightning round or the fun part. Okay. And Johnny gave me free reign. He said, you pick, <laughs> so. <laughs> Assuming she was gonna be nice. <laughs> okay. All right, so. I thought this was a pretty apropos question, given yes. your current role, your very first paying job. First paying job. So it depends. W-2, now I'm really dating myself. But so my first paying job was cutting lawns in my neighborhood because I, my, my, I wanted some Nike shoes. And my mother told me, this is where my money will go, Sears and Roebuck. So I was like, I can't wear those shoes. So I had to go cut yards there. That was my first kind of paying job. But my first official paying job was at a restaurant called Lums in South Florida. And I actually washed dishes at a Lums restaurant. All right. So we asked you, we played Ain't No Mountain High Enough, which you said was your favorite Motown song as you were coming on. You get to pick any musician or band for a private concert in your backyard with your family and friends. Who is it? Oh, that's easy. Patty LaBelle. You know, it's, just, ah. it's gonna be Miss Patty, right? Patty right. LaBelle is gonna be in the back and she's gonna say it. Closely followed by Mary J. Blige, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> right. MJB in the house. <laughs> All right, so continued peek inside the world of Johnny uh, C. Taylor. Something on your bucket list. Hmm. So I want to travel around the world. I want to take a three, four, five, six month period and literally travel around the world. And I've, I don't know about you all, but you know, I, I have more of an appreciation for the people in, Western, in European countries who have sabbaticals or in the, in the academy because you know, we work so hard. And how many times have you ever, you work and then you die almost, right? How many times have you had a period of time where you could literally, I travel a lot in my job. I mentioned in the last month I've been in Indonesia, India, I mean, ever North Korea, not North Korea, South Korea. Um, and the fact of the matter is I go in, it's a hotel, it's a plane, it's a business meeting, and I'm out. But really being able to decompress, I would love to do that. So travel around the world, give myself six months to just kind of visit stuff. Fantastic. So 
last question before mm -hmm. I turn it back over to Steve, which is our favorite here at the DEC. Uh oh. <laughs> Advice to your 25 year old self. Oh, wow. Um, it was so long ago. <laughs> so, uh, actually, that's, I ask my team that, don't I, Emily, a lot. I say, what would you say to your 20, but Emily, Emily is my chief staff and head of government affairs and public affairs and all that. But, uh, so she knows me really well. My advice is y you've got to not take yourself so seriously. Those of us who are type A personalities who were invariably going to be ending up in a C-suite somewhere, uh, we're so intense until you wake up and you realize you're only going to be 25 once. And there are just real things that you can do at 25. Caution to the wind. You don't have kids. You don't have responsibilities. You can do whatever. But I was so focused on achieving my career goals that I think I could have added a little more fun in the process. Now, not imbalance, because if I was busy having fun, then I wouldn't be, I wouldn't achieve the things I wanted to achieve. But I could probably add a healthy dose of fun, a little bit more fun, even in the workplace. And that requires not taking yourself so seriously. We, we're, you're driven to be so successful. And then you wake up and say, I've achieved it. And I'm actually generally pretty happy. But my God, if I could go back, there's, I'd like not take myself so seriously and not take every decision as, oh my gosh, this is the end of the world. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you, Johnny, for thank sharing you your all. time, thank a bit you. about yourself, thank your you. candor. Thank I'm going to turn it over to Steve to close us out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy, thank you. You did an incredible job as thank presiding you. officer. Thank you. Johnny Taylor, you're fascinating. I love your book. You're welcome back here anytime you want to come right. back and see us another yes, time. Yes, throw a car in. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> this is Detroit. I mean, come on. Is there a GM Ford? Another round of applause for Johnny Taylor. Thank, thank you. you.